Awesome. Um, so thanks for joining us. Uh, nice to see the room full. Uh, it's a sign that you care about OpenStack and, and whether it's cost efficient or not. Um, my name is Bruno. I'm the general manager of cloud computing at Catalyst IT. Um, I feel very privileged working for Catalyst IT because um, I had the experience of going through, you know, planning, designing, um, building, operating, um, and, and um, running an OpenStack cloud, a public cloud, the first public cloud in New Zealand. Um, and, and as a result of that, I think I have developed a good understanding of how the numbers stack up for OpenStack, uh, how the cost model works, the total cost of ownership, and how that compares to other cloud providers. We're asked about how our cloud compares to other cloud providers very often. Um, and we also help customers to do their own uh, OpenStack implementation, their own OpenStack private clouds. And in that context, they also ask us, you know, how much will my compute instances in my private cloud cost compared to using this or that? So that's from where that experience uh, that I'm sharing with you uh, comes from. And this is my co-presenter who made it. Yes. yes. Thank you. I'm Bruno Morel. I'm the software development director of uh, InternApp, basically. And I'm sorry, I'm so jet lagged that I slept through. That's OK. <laughs> As you can see, I'm all sweaty. I'm not used to, to that weather. We work in Montreal, so you can imagine that uh, the weather right there is not exactly on par. Um, so we are a public cloud provider. So we provide public cloud uh, based infrastructure. All, everything is based on, on OpenStack. Um, so that's why we think that we have a, a, com a communication and, and some things to share about the comparison that we can make with the Amazon, especially in pricing. I have a theory that you're sweating because you think OpenStack can be up for. Yeah, no, I'm so scared. You're worried. I don't know truth. what's inside the presentation. I didn't make it, so <laughs> I never know. Right. Um, so would you like to start yeah, with that? So, yeah, so uh, of course, it's very complicated to compare, as we said, Apple and Orange. So basically what happens, if you know a bit about Amazon Web Services, is that there's so many variables in the way that they price their offering. Um, so as much as we can, we try to make it fair for them. Because the point is not to cheat or anything. The point is to make it so that if ever you were to have the same exact services, one of an OpenStack open public cloud, uh, one on uh, Amazon Web Services, and maybe one on your own private cloud, that you would be able to compare and see what's the difference. Okay, that's the point. So we add to simplify a bit, just for the sake of it. Um, there's no way that you could compare exactly the model that Amazon is using, simply because their model is not exactly fully transparent. If you were thinking about overcome it, of the, the different way that they calculate the vCPU, for example. Uh, and there's all, also, we won't go into storage differences. We won't go into the way that they calculate some behind the scene of the services. So the idea was basically to find the baseline we could compare, and from there, we uh, can expose what is exactly the difference. And of course, depending on your own uh, workload, uh, you will have to try to custom that to your own uh, needs, basically. Um, I'll give you an example where that applies. Um, so. Um Bruno is uh, comparing Sorry. AWS prices uh, with the internet public cloud, whereas what I'm doing here is um, I have produced a, a total cost of ownership model for an OpenStack private cloud implementation uh, that is being shared openly uh, under a Creative Commons license as part of this presentation. So you guys can go in and see how you know, that, that was done. Um, but, uh, for example, if you have a compute instance on Amazon with uh, 3.75 uh, you know, gigabytes of RAM, and on the internet cloud, Bruno has got something with 4 gigabytes of RAM, uh, then you know, there's a slight difference there in terms of the comparison. What we've done in those situations is to actually put that advantage uh, on, on the Amazon side, and we've chosen on our side a flavor that actually delivers more CPU or more RAM than what Amazon is delivering, just to make that as fair as possible. Um, it, yep. Yeah. Let's Good. Go. So let's right. talk about hardware. So the first thing that we took into account, of course, is the compute itself. Um, so we started with the CPU, um, so trying to find 
as much equivalent. Um, so on our side, we, we have two flavors of cloud plus bare metal. Um, what we did is that we took uh, what we call the A1, which is a, an overcommit ratio of 3 to 1, uh, for all the M1 of Amazon. But then again, you will have to go into the detail if you think it's fair. We do think it's fair for Amazon. Um, for everything that was more than M1, we use what we call the B1 on our cloud, which is basically an overcommit ratio of 1 to 1. Um, so you get one, v, one vCPU for one, VC, one core for one vCPU. Um, so from there, we looked into the storage, because of course you can have no storage, you can have SSD, you can have a spin disk. So we, we try to match as much possible, not only uh, the type of storage, but the capacity of the storage, and the RAM, because of course that's also an important part, depending on your workload, the number of gigabytes of RAM that you get is really important. And once we move all of that, we looked at the different price to match as much possible the price per hour that Amazon was providing you. Yeah. Um, so one thing that I would like to highlight is um, how these prices vary per location. So if you consume public cloud uh, services, you probably have seen that you know uh, public cloud prices tend to they tend to be cheaper in the United States and more expensive in, in Europe, and in our case, we're based in, in New Zealand, Australia region, and that, that's where the prices are even more expensive. It's um, so um, what we've done is uh, we are using, uh, for, for the uh, internet comparison, uh, Bruno has got a region, uh, Canada, United States, and- So uh, to be precise, it's uh, US East, so New York, New Jersey, uh, West, so um, the equivalent of uh, San Jose for us, yeah. um, and in Europe, Amsterdam. Okay, yeah. so we, we took the Virginia for Amazon, uh, we took the California one, I don't remember the city, and uh, Europe it was Amsterdam too for Amazon. Mm. Um, the, on, on the private cloud side, uh, there is something important that I need to share with you. Uh, I have included in that total cost of ownership reference prices for um, the actual hardware. So when I talk about a compute node, for example, you will find in there a bill of materials with all the uh, you know, the chassis, the server board, the CPU, the RAM, uh, and some reference prices there. But what is important for you to know is that I've based those prices on what I can buy in New Zealand, which is typically more expensive than, you know, those of you coming from the United States would pay for hardware. So once again, uh, that is uh, an advantage for uh, Amazon in, in, in the United States because I'll pay more for hardware in New Zealand than Amazon would in, in, in the United States. Uh, so I kept that as it is. The only thing I've done in, in the private cloud model is to convert the end cost, which is in New Zealand dollars, to US dollars, just doing a currency conversion. And I'm actually going to go back and compare that uh, with the Amazon price in the United States uh, on, on the East Coast, which is where I believe you get the cheapest prices for uh, Amazon AWS right now. Yeah. So, yeah. So there's, 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 on Amazon, there's a lot of services that you can get. So there's EMR, there's DynamoDB, and so on and so on. There's a lot of galaxy of services. Uh, OpenStack has some of them. Um, some pro pro public cloud providers, sorry, do provide some of them. Some don't. So what we did is that we removed that from the equation, as sad as we were, uh, just for the sake of being to compare something that's fair for everybody. Uh, of course, uh, we will compare the price of our own public cloud. Uh, so there's nobody of Rackspace that's here. Anybody know? Okay. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. So just to be fair, we would like Rackspace to do the same exercise as, as uh, Bruno said. We, we are gonna sharing share sorry the the spreadsheet. So you could just have to put the number there and be able to see what's the difference. Uh, so your marketing should be able to, to do some some stuff around with that. Um, and, uh, and so for the services and all the bell, bell and whistles that Amazon gave, gave you, we simply make it so that we made the hypothesis that you had to manage that yourself, basically. So we added engineer, uh, engineering hours, basically, of, a, of a DevOps, uh, two hours. What we made is we took a, an average of what we think is a fair salary, even though you could even go into that and, and put your own salary and be able to, to see what the numbers look like. Uh, so it's $90 an hour. 
because uh, there's a difference between even inside the US it's different, in Canada it's different, New Zealand I'm guessing is different. Uh, and we considered that overall during a span of a year um, to just maintain, for example, a DB, a database instance, a, a database instance uh, you, you would have to input two hours per month. Then again, you can change that and see how it reacts. If you need more than two hours, that means you have other problems, but then. So that was the assumption on the uh, internet uh, public cloud, whereas uh, for the private cloud, I'm assuming you're running Trove, I'm assuming you're running the Neutron uh, load balancer um, using something like Octavia. So on the private cloud side, I haven't added any time for a database, a managed database service or a managed uh, load, load balancer. Now, there's also something I would like to acknowledge here, um, and that is first the fact that um, Amazon has been doing this for a very, very long time. And I'm saying this because, you know, many years ago, uh, I was doing a lot of cloud computing on top of Amazon AWS before OpenStack existed. Um, so the fact that they have a, a breadth of services that is not yet available in OpenStack, uh, we see that reaching is happening with the, you know, big tent and more projects coming up. Uh, but there are things you cannot find yet that exist in there. Uh, one example, and please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, if you're deploying Elasticsearch as a service uh, in OpenStack, as far as I'm aware, uh, there's no service yet that allows you to do an Elasticsearch as a service on top of OpenStack, whereas on Amazon you can go and say, give me Elasticsearch, right? Uh, so one, we would like to acknowledge that there is a breadth of services in there that doesn't exist yet in OpenStack, and it's a matter of time. Uh, we are a young community. Um, the, the second thing um, is just acknowledging the fact that a lot of what we've done in OpenStack as well has been inspired by what Amazon AWS did. So when I look at things like uh, Nova or even Heat, the fact that Heat started with cloud formation templates and then the actual Heat templates uh, after that, you, you can see that we derive a lot of inspiration from what's happening with other cloud providers. So just acknowledge that fact. Um, I think it's important. So, Let's get started. Yeah. Enough of the introduction. Yeah. So that was the, basically the model. Okay. Just to explain where the difference will be. Uh, what we wanted, again, was to be fair with Amazon. I don't know if anybody of you know the Amazon monthly calculator. Looks like this. And By the way, the, you're not expected to read those, yeah, yeah, those the, things. Don't, don't read the data. What's important is what is uh, uh, underlined is basically the template. Okay. That's what we took. We took the template. We made an equivalent of all the Bessel, Bell and Whistle uh, of Amazon, uh, and then we looked at the number. Uh, I think that it's the fairest. It represents a b real business use case. Uh, that's the way that Amazon interpret them, so I would maybe challenge some of them in the way that they are spreaded, but then that's the way uh, you can compare something that's fair. That's the way they at least um, try to uh, simplify and demonstrate what their price point is. So that's so what we are going to use. These templates, when you go to the AWS calculator, on the, re on the right side you have common customer uh, samples and you have things like a large web application. And if you click on large web application, that will pre-populate the calculator with you know, some web application server, some storage, some, uh, for you on your behalf. So we took that reference architecture that goes into the calculator and apply the OpenStack prices to it to have a like-for-like -like comparison. Um, so there's one thing I would like to tell you about the uh, total cost of ownership model and the, uh, pri on the private cloud side, right? If you're deploying a private cloud, I have made an assumption that you're not trying to go to market and make money with it and have a, you know, a, a profit margin there that would allow you to afford a big marketing team, a big sales team. What I'm assuming there is that you want to recover your costs. You're doing a private cloud and you want to pay for that private cloud and make sure that you recover your costs. So um, I, I won't show you the actual spreadsheet because, you know, I'll probably ev everyone will go um, to sleep if we do that. Uh, you're welcome to have a look at it later. Uh, but the one thing that I want to show is that um, to make this comparison very interesting, I wanted to show you what the bottom line, what is the lowest cost you can get from, from OpenStack would look like and try to get as close as possible to it. So we're talking about a large private cloud. We're talking about a private cloud that will have something like 200 compute nodes, about 100 storage nodes, a few racks, you know, a, a spine switch layer, some top rack, uh, top rack switches, um, and it will have staff 
uh, operating this cloud 24 by 7. So I have assumed six people operating this cloud 24 by 7. Um, and what you can see here is that per month, that, cost, uh, that, that private cloud would cost something like uh, $428,000. Uh, it's a large private cloud. You can scale that back in that model uh, if, if you want. Uh, but the important thing is, if you're using all the resources provided by this cloud, and there is a lot in there, there are 86,000 vCPUs, uh, 226 terabytes of RAM, um, a petabyte of object storage, almost a petabyte of, of block storage. If you are using all of this and selling it for what I say that cost is, uh, you would get back the, uh, the money, the, the investment you've made on your private cloud to the point where you recovering your costs, right? So ultimately, it's a cost recovery model. It's not, I'm going to market and I'm going to sell that private cloud. Yep. This is what his model is. So you get both tastes um, of it. And we wish that we could sell all of our capacity 100% of the time. Fortunately, that's not always yep. the case. Uh, there are variables in that model that would allow you to tweak them and say, uh, I won't have my capacity used 100% of the time. I'll, I'll use 80%, 70%. So feel free to go in there and tweak that. Yeah, so let's look a bit about the number to give you a bit of an understanding of what we are really talking about. So if we take an M3 medium uh, East Coast uh, instance in Amazon, that would be one vCPU. Again, you can go into look into the detail of what really that vCPU is. We consider that it is a full core, okay? Um, we, you get 3.75 gigabyte of RAM, that's the Amazon thing, uh, and you get a 4 gigabyte of SSD. So the way that we matched it on our cloud would be what we call a B11. So again, it's a one core per vCPU, so that's one vCPU, you get a full core, enjoy it. Uh, 4 gigabyte of RAM and 4 gigabyte of SSD. So it's pretty much a match, okay? Um, whereas on the private cloud side, um, the, over the CPU over commit ratio on the TCO model is four. Um, I believe most cloud providers, public cloud providers, are doing some CPU over commit, not memory over commit, but some CPU over commit, because the reality for most of them is that their servers are underutilized and they are trying to bump it a little bit on the, on, on the CPU side. Yeah. So there is an over commit uh, of four. In, in the private cloud model. And by the way, uh, we kept the prices here all you know, per hour. Um, notice that there is an additional zero here compared to that. Maybe we should yeah. have done prices per month so it would be easier to read. But so if we look at a second example, so that would be a kind of a big machine. So it's a three, C3, sorry, ATX large. So that's, that's something that you want to use with the huge workload, not something that uh, your mother should, should rent. Um, so it's a 23 vCPU, that's a weird number, but that's the number. You get 60 uh, gigabyte of RAM and you get uh, two, three, 20 gigabyte uh, twice uh, of SSD. Uh, on our side, unfortunately, we don't provide such a big uh, virtual machine. So what we decided to do is that to use the bare metal, okay? so. Look just at the, the price, that's a, a big difference just in the way that we price our offering with bare metal. Um, so it's fair in the sense that with Amazon, you probably get a bit more, but it's still expensive, okay? So what you get with our E5 2620 V3 is that you get two, uh, 12 cores, um, you get 64 gigabyte of RAM, and you get uh, three, uh, 480 sorry, gigabyte of SSD, oh. okay? So, and, and it's a bare metal, it's yours. So all in all, even yeah. if the comparison is not exactly a match, we think that it, it is fair. Yeah. Um, you can still go inside the, the spreadsheet and play with the, the corresponding um, matches. So you can, you can change that and see how it affects the, the different prices. Yep. Whereas on the private cloud side, I have included exactly the same, um, um, a, a flavor that actually has got more vCPUs, uh, about the same amount of RAM, four gigabytes more of RAM. Uh, one important thing is um, 
I don't necessarily believe it's a good idea to include storage prices in the compute side of things. If you're buying compute, you're buying CPU and RAM, and if you're buying storage, you're buying storage. So I leave uh, all the uh, block storage costs. If you need a root volume for your computing instance, uh, that's a block storage cost that is coming from, from, from Ceph down here. Uh, and talking about object storage, we are comparing uh, with uh, Amazon S3 using three replicas of your data, uh, not the reduced uh, replica. Yep. Uh, on the private cloud side, I'm comparing that with a Swift implementation that also has got three replicas, no erasure coding, just plain three replicas out of the box. Um, anything you would like to mention about the object storage for internet? So yeah, we basically use a solid fire if you want to know. Uh, uh, storage, so this is exposed through Swift. So yeah, it's basically the performance should be comparable. If it's not, please call me. I guess the main difference is um, his object storage is backed by SSD. Yeah, it's SSD backed. On yeah. the private cloud side, that's backed by you know SATA drives, yeah. uh, and I imagine that on the Amazon side, they're also using SATA drives, not SSDs. So I, I would yeah. expect your object storage to be faster. To be it honest, it should be. Um, on, on the block storage side, um, that's uh, EBS volumes uh, using SSDs. Um, yeah. So on the OpenStack side, I'm comparing that with uh, Ceph running uh, with SSDs. And if you want to look in the spreadsheet, you have you know the number of replicas, how many node failures are accepted, uh, acceptable. Um, all, all those variables are there. Um, and uh, on, us in Cinder, but with SSD uh, backing them. So. Yeah. So, yeah. Let's so let's get explain started. what's the simple marketing website. So sorry, you are seeing all the number, but uh, we'll just focus on the on the part we was on the left. So that's basically what Amazon uh, considers a simple marketing website. Uh, it is a high traffic, static web page, con static content kind of a website. So you get a load balancer. That's a little thingy, upworm. Uh, you get two uh, web application, uh, basically, uh, servers, so it's basically PHP. Um, and you get two terabytes of object storage, and you also have one terabyte of bandwidth out, okay? So if you look at the number, we won't go into it too much, but you're already starting to see that we uh, do have a slight advantage, so that's still a 50% different. For different story for uh, for the public cloud. Surprisingly, as it is a simple configuration, uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense to have your own private cloud for this. Um, but still, if you want to know, it's a bit less expensive than what you would get uh, using Amazon. Yep. Uh, but there is one important factor we want to show here. Uh, yep. If you break down that total cost from, from Amazon, uh, you will actually notice that storage and compute are just a, a small portion of it, and that in this scenario, there is a lot of data traffic. Mm -hmm. So the, the bandwidth, the outgoing traffic, accounts for a good chunk of your costs in, in this scenario. Uh, and what is important is on the private cloud model, uh, you are deploying this private cloud in your data center. So I cannot make assumptions on your behalf on what agreements you have with your ISPs in terms of how much bandwidth will cost. So to be fair, what I've done is, I took the uh, data uh, transit costs from Amazon and applied that to the uh, model, yeah. right? So, yeah. So if we look at uh, another example, that's a more meaty example, that's a large web application. So that's something that's doing less traffic, but is more complex inside the application itself. So there's a load balancer. There's two web front, what Amazon could call web front, so basically, basically Nginx uh, instances. Uh, the, probably. Um, there's uh, two web applications, uh, so real, uh, it's Ruby, an example, uh, it's, the example is based on Ruby, sorry. There's uh, one uh, MySQL DB, relational, and one NoSQL DB, and a bit of object storage. So there's a bit of everything. Um, and then again, you can start to see that uh, we are making a, a bit of a difference, but now the private cloud start to really make sense. Yeah. So the, the third one is a mob mobile application. So um, for those that do a mobile application, I hope you know, uh, most of the processing should be done on 
the mobile uh, application itself. So there's not much that the application does. So it's basically uh, the API layer. So that would be your Ruby, PHP, Python layer, tool or balancer. Uh, there's a lot of object storage, of course, because you want to whatever they upload or whatever, whatever they, they uh, interact and, and create, you want to store it. There is a uh, two uh, relational database. It's MySQL in the Amazon template. There's two non-relational, so no SQL database. And there's a huge load of traffic, one terabyte per month. Um, uh, now you're really starting to see the difference. If you look at the number, that's almost uh, 40, 50 percent difference for the public cloud, the OpenStack public cloud. Of course, if you go the private cloud way, even though you have to manage yourself, it really does make a difference. Um, and this is how that specific template, yeah. uh, the, the, the breakdown, of course. And you can see that in this case, you have more compute, more storage, the, 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 the bandwidth is not necessarily the significant portion, and therefore, you know, your private cloud costs start um, yeah. showing the difference there. And there's something also that you need to notice. Still, yeah. the bandwidth is That's a good. huge thing that people neglect when they, when they go and look at the price. Um, uh, you will pay a huge amount for the bandwidth that Amazon serves you out. Um, it's really important to take that into account. Most of the OpenStack public cloud provider do have some free tier. Amazon does have two, but it's really low, honestly, for us at least. Um, so Rackspace does have one, uh, SoftLayer does have one, and that makes a difference at the end of your months and probably year. Um, there's also something else that you need to think about, especially those of you that use a lot of the bell and whistle, so the services, the DRMR, the EMR, sorry, uh, DynamoDB and so on and so forth, is the more you use it and the more you pass the free tier threshold and the more you are going to pay for the API requests. Uh, so the get, okay, you, you get a huge amount of get for uh, a very small sum, but the put in the list adds up very quickly. So again, when you do the equivalent and the estimation, do not take like that. Yeah. So I guess the, the takeaway here is don't ignore the costs um, that will come in relation to API requests. And on the private cloud side, what I've done is if you're interacting with object storage, for example, and you're doing a get or a put to object storage, uh, I assume that that control plane where you're running your Swift uh, APIs um, are actually an overhead uh, of having that, that, that storage. So in the price per gigabyte of the uh, object storage, there is um, the, the API request baked in. Uh, and it's up to you to decide if that control plane is you know, big enough for, for your needs and scaling um, that out. And on, our, on the public uh, cloud side, uh, you basically get it for free. Um, unless you really are a crazy API-based consumer, um, we're going to get you the request for free. I know no uh, public cloud provider that will make you pay for the OpenStack APIs, okay? Unless, again, if you have so much calls, then it starts to show in the graphs. But for now, you should be good. Yeah. Um, and, and by the way, I'll mention something in relation to the Catalyst public cloud. Um, we are not uh, charging for uh, object storage uh, API requests because it's not possible in OpenStack. Um, but that's actually a deliberate decision right now because um, one of the complaints we've heard from customers using Amazon AWS is that the pricing model is so complicated that they cannot figure out how, the, how, how much they will pay for something. So mm -hmm. we try to simplify that model where they, they can tell us how much storage they're going to use, right? And, and we made a few assumptions on their behalf. Uh, and on average, those assumptions are, are correct. You know, some customers will use less API requests, some customers will use more, and on average, uh, we keep a track of that and, and they are correct. Yeah. So another template is a different one. It's disaster recovery. So basically, uh, it, it goes to say that uh, you should have disaster recovery. If you don't, that's something that you should look, look at. Um, it implies, of course, that you have multiple regions. Uh, we so the template is very simple in the Amazon monthly calculator. It's basically two dBs for each region, some traffic in between the region, and object storage. Okay, nothing much. Uh, there you can see that as it's more a compute-based workload, the difference is not much between the public cloud, still 
around 20, 10, 20 percent. Uh, but then the private cloud kills us, for sure. <laughs> And last but not least, big data. So uh, the Amazon template is basically one uh, job task uh, node and uh, 12 worker nodes. Uh, each of those nodes are big, giant compute, basically. Um, that's really the end of the line for Amazon, and that's our best bare metal on our side. Um, so there's a, a bit of object storage because you, you need to, to store those results somewhere. Uh, and of course, you need to get them out unless you just want to uh, leave them there. Um, so that's where, uh, honestly, it makes a huge difference. And people do neglect the difference that both the bandwidth uh, and the compute can, can make. But at that level, uh, any difference is going to make a, a huge end result. Um, so as you can see, it's a 50% per year, which probably you should really think about if you go and use Amazon for that. Um, and private cloud, I don't want to talk about it. It's depressing for me. <laughs> <laughs> Look, this is the bottom line, right? No one is going <laughs> is to market with prices like this. Um, but it's what you can achieve internally if you have your own engineering team. Yeah. So, I guess the, the, the conclusion here is, you know, can, can OpenStack beat Amazon AWS in price? And, and the answer is, when you're talking about compute, block storage, object storage, networking, you know, that common layer that we have, uh, yes, it's definitely possible. And if, if you've uh, taken the time to actually, you know, work, work, work the mess, look at the, the, the uh, model, uh, you will find out that doing your own private cloud um, can bring substantial uh, financial benefits to your business. Um, but the important thing is, it only makes sense at a certain scale, right? Mm -hmm. um, go back to that um, TCO analysis that I was doing for a large private cloud that costs you maybe 400000 per month, and that includes everything, power, cooling, rec space, the servers. If you only have one virtual machine running in that private cloud, now you have one virtual machine that costs $450,000. Uh, uh, and that's not very good. <laughs> <laughs> or if you can afford it, do it. It's pretty cool. <laughs> so, so, so there is a place for it, right? It, it, if cloud computing is an important capability for your organization, if it's core business, uh, then it does make sense for you to build an engineering team uh, and, and, and pursue deploying your own private cloud. Or uh, if, if it's uh, not necessarily core business, but it's important for you, it's important for your IT strategy, maybe partnering with a company that will help you to deploy your private cloud and maybe manage that remotely for you so that you don't have to build that big engineering team yourself uh, will, will make sense. Yeah. And also what we, what we see a lot too is a mix of both. So for some workload, you're going to use a public OpenStack public cloud. For the others, you're going to make your own private cloud. Uh, again, it's all about, of course, as a public cloud provider, we do have economy of scale, especially in bandwidth and some of the hardware and so on and so forth that you cannot have if you do your own private cloud. So negotiating with Supermicro or Intel is something different when you buy, you know, you buy them by the boatload or you just want 200 of them. Um, so it's always, I think, important for you to think about what should be my private cloud workload and what should be my public cloud workload, okay? Especially if you use OpenStack, that it's going to be the same APIs, okay? So maybe the IP, the endpoint will change, but that's all. That's just a, it should be just a configuration. It's not you just need to talk to your developers. Yeah. But um, so, yeah, it's possible. Look at it. Um, if you have questions or comments, uh, we'll have five minutes uh, now at the end of the session, but you've got our contacts there. Feel free to get in touch and discuss how that model was done. Uh, we're deliberately sharing the, the spreadsheet, the model, so you guys can have a look at it and see how we've done the comparison uh, at your own time uh, and, and potentially contribute to that. Because I think it's ex important for us as a community uh, to explain to people, this is what OpenStack looks like on paper when, you know, the, the, when, when we add up the numbers. Um, and finally, if you want to um, get access to this presentation, get access to all the spreadsheets and the calculation. Um, Play with it, please. That's the, the one you want. Yeah. So that's where you're going to find all the information, the model that he uses for the TCO of the private cloud. 
uh, the simple calculation that we use for the public cloud, the different templates, um, that everything is there, everything is available to you. You can change it, you can tweak it, you can make it your own, you can add complexity to it. We wish you would do it because we really do think that's something that we should talk about and make it visible. Uh, it's okay, sometimes we're gonna compete with the Amazon or in between each other and we're gonna be good and that's healthy, I think. Uh, but we should have this conversation. Thank you. So, um, if you guys have questions, please use the microphone. Yeah, please. We have five minutes for questions. Yeah, go ahead. How many employees do you foresee for an in-house OpenStack installation? Because yesterday I went to a presentation from Cisco saying uh, you need at least eight full-time employees to go for production, and the OpenStack engineers are twice as expensive as VMware. <laughs> Depends where. Um, <laughs> well, maybe, right? So um, yeah. we are a public um, cloud provider in New Zealand, and I can tell you that when we started with our public cloud, uh, we didn't have eight employees full-time operating the cloud, and yet our customers were getting some pretty good service levels from us, even though we didn't have eight people. Nowadays, we may have more than eight people. Um, it, you grow, right? Um, the, the important thing is, on that total cost of ownership, there are some variables in there. Uh, one of the variables is uh, how much an, an open stack engineer will cost per hour. Uh, the second thing is, um, when you're adding up everything, what I've done is to propose three scenarios. One is you have a small um, private cloud, eight by five, and in this case, I'm saying you have two people. If you consider this is not enough for you and you need eight people for an eight by five small cloud with three compute nodes, you're welcome to change the numbers and see what, what happens there. So there are three scenarios, the small private cloud, eight by five, a medium private cloud, uh, eight by five, and then the one I was comparing with, which is the large private cloud, 24 by seven, where you have 300 compute nodes, 40 block storage nodes, 50 object storage nodes. And the, the price point, of course, the cost will vary depending on the size of your private cloud. Um, so in a lot of the cases, uh, your costs were like, you know, two, three, four, five times uh, a private OpenStack cloud. Yeah. Um, so why can't you bring your costs to 50% yeah, more than OpenStack sort of more consistently? Uh, why? So what, what, what's stopping you from bringing down your costs you know, closer to the cost of a private OpenStack cloud? So you're asking that to me as a public cloud provider, or yeah, you're asking I, that to me as a private... <laughs> well, if, if you want to compete with private cloud, right? Because you're making the, in, in this talk, you're making the argument that um, at a certain scale, and which is not actually really large scale, just a few hundred nodes, um, you are better off going for a private cloud. So why can't you drive your so, costs down, since you do have some economies of scale, I presume? So, again... You, you want to Can I address it okay, initially? Okay, okay. So, uh, <laughs> I, I, I think the important uh, point to observe here is if you've done the maths, um, a lot of people say that uh, public cloud computing is a, a race to the bottom, and, and maybe it is. Uh, but if you've done the maths, you see that the bottom is very far away from where it is right now, and at the moment, it's good business to be uh, doing, right? So. Um, the margins in, in the public cloud uh, business uh, are reasonable, um, and some companies have a very big marketing sales team and overheads that you wouldn't have in your private cloud in order to sell their public clouds. They will do events with 10 million people in Vegas. Um, they will you know, have a lot of uh, solution people. architects that come to your place to show you how you can use more and more their services, and that has got a cost. And that cost overhead is applied, uh, and, and in the end, their margins are not as big as you know this. So remember that in a in, in a private cloud environment, you're going for cost recovery. You're not going for the market to sell something. Yeah. So that's where basically the difference is. Any other question? I'm not a native English speaker, but I think there is a word for that, and the translation from from Portuguese would be something called uh, scheming. The market, does that make scheming? sense? <laughs> scheming? Sure scheming? Something like that? Yeah, I think that's a marketing technique, isn't it? Okay, enough about that. Uh, the microphone, if you please. I'm sorry, because it's recorded. So. Or give, give me your question, and we'll repeat afterward. Okay, cool. No more question? Thank you very much.